Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness, mercy, grace, and compassion. Above all, we thank you for Jesus. Thank you for his precious and redeeming blood, for your holy written word, and for the mighty Holy Spirit. With great joy, unspeakable and full of glory, we deposit this service into your charge for safekeeping. We thank you now, sir, in advance for anointing our ears, minds, hearts, and souls to receive the engrafted word of God. We welcome the supernatural of God to be in manifestation in this service, even as the Spirit wills. And for all that shall be said, wrought, revealed, and manifested, we covenant to give you and you alone all of the praise, the honor, and the glory with adoration and thanksgiving. For we do so in Jesus' name, amen and amen. Praise the Lord. Well, we're talking about things we need to know now. Things we need to know now. We are watching literally biblical prophecy unfolding, presenting itself, manifesting itself in real time. Many people are going about their lives unaware of what is really happening in the world today. Jesus cited these things in the 24th chapter of Matthew's gospel. He unpacked a lot of things that would be happening in a time he uh, tagged the beginning of sorrows. And yes, it's just some sorrowful things that are a part of what he had to reveal and unfold and said what happened. And all of this came as a result of a request made by his disciples who wanted to know uh, or were curious about when would all these things calamities and things happen and when would the end of the world be now of course no one knows when the end of the world will be you know jesus said very directly that no man knows the day or the hour that in fact his return is scheduled only the father he said uh has that information and so it's silly for people to pray and second guess and attempt to figure out if god's got a secret <laughs> you're not going to figure it out not short of him revealing it to you, amen? But since Jesus was quite adamant in saying, no man knows the day or the hour, don't even bother, okay? Just be also ready. That's the key, be ready. That's why I'm talking about the things we need to know now because as I said, Jesus unpacked some very serious things. A couple of great things he said. He said, number one, see that no man deceive you. Number two, see that you be not troubled. So we need to avoid falling prey to deception and delusion. And I'm telling you, it, both of them are out here in a big way. There's a lot of deception going on. There's a lot of delusion uh, presenting itself, manifesting itself. In other words, people are deluded. They're believing one thing when in fact it is another. There are people that have confidence that what they think is happening or even what they're told is happening is the real happening. Listen, when it comes down to this present age that we're living in right now, this beginning of sorrows, this last of the last days, you better stick with Jesus, all right? I don't know about the trilateral network news people and all the media outlets and things like that, the papers there, everybody's speculating on what's going, and especially, and particularly at the time that we are sharing this message with you, there is quite a conflict going on in the Middle East. We have Israel, they're trying to root out the Hamas terrorist uh, group, and uh, there's definitely a lot of collateral damage going on in that. And to be honest with you, all wars have that as one of their principal byproducts. Uh, they, you know, in the military, it's called collateral damage. It, it really means the uh, unfortunate demise of civilians. In other words, innocent civilians, people that are not combatants, but unfortunately are somewhere in close proximity to the theater of battle, and, and that happens. And there aren't any wars in recorded human history that do not that have never had casualties on both sides of it. I mean, right here in our own nation, there have been a bunch, you know, this, this Revolutionary War, the Civil War, the Spanish-American War, uh, and then we had international conflicts, the Korean War, the Vietnam, Vietnam War, World Wars I and II, and now people are surmising that we're on the threshold of World War III. So the question is, what do we need to know now? First thing you need to know is what Jesus said, see that no man deceive you. So how do you avoid that? You stick with the word of God. Because see, the Bible says this. Now, this is not a play on words. I'm gonna unfold this. 
In Numbers chapter 23 and verse 19, the Bible says there that God is not a man that he should lie. Neither is he the son of man that he should repent. Now, at first glance, when you hear that statement, you say, well, wait a minute. It, didn't God show up as a man in the person Christ Jesus? Yes, he did. Wait a minute. It, did he say he's not the son of man that he should repent? Yeah, that was said. And you see, because I know Jesus is identified. He has identified himself during his earthly ministry as the son of man. But the phrase from the Numbers 23, 19 out of the Hebrew text is literally saying that Jesus is not of human origin, which is the reason that he doesn't need to repent. He's not of human origin. He's not among, he, he's not of fallen humanity. Whoa. <laughs> because the seed that brought him into earth was the seed of the word of God. The Virgin Mary literally conceived the word of God. And that thing, as it was said in scripture, that holy thing that she would be bringing forth would be called the son of God. His name would be called Emmanuel because he would save his people from their sins. So that's what it means there. God, listen, God is not a man that he should lie. So it's impossible for God to lie. Neither is he the son of man, meaning he's not of human origin, that he is required to repent as we are required to repent. Why? Because all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That is all of us that have proceeded forth from the first man, the first woman, Adam and Eve. Because when the fall took place in the garden, I'm not talking about a season now, I'm talking about a spiritual fall. When, when Adam committed high treason in the garden of Eden, rebelled against God, and went against what God told him and warned him against doing, eating the forbidden fruit and so forth, it brought about the fall of all humanity. Why? Because all of humanity was essentially in the loins of Adam. So when God breathed the breath of life into Adam and Adam became a living soul, listen, let me tell you something. <laughs> that breath has brought about all humans as you see them today, all, all of them. That one breath started the whole chain reaction there. And it's still going, ladies and gentlemen. It's still going. There, there are more humans being born in the world, even in these moments that we speak, just as many are leaving this world in these moments that we speak. So these are important things we need to understand and things we need to know now. It's just to sort of give you a setting and a perspective. Because without a biblical worldview, the world can easily throw you off. It can steep you in deception. It can steep you in uh, delusion. And, and I tell you, you, you can't keep consuming a steady diet of negative news. See, the principle is this from Romans, the 10th chapter. So then faith comes by hearing. Now, faith for what? Faith in God's word comes from hearing God's word. But, but the principle is, the mechanic of it is, faith does come by hearing. Now, if you hear incessantly negative news, you're going to have faith for that. That's the faith you're going to have to believe for. Negative news. Is, bad things are going to happen to me. The worst possible things are going to happen to me. This, that, and so forth. Uh, so the faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Well, the God kind of faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. But there is this track, so to speak, of hearing and you'll get faith developed depending on whatever it is you're focused on and hearing. It just makes that deposit. Thank God if you keep, that's why Jesus said, see that no man deceive you. Well, the greatest way you can avoid that or circumvent that situation is stay in and with the word of God. What does he say? Well, for example, in Proverbs chapter 14, verse 12, it says this, there is a way which seems right to a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. See, there's a lot of things that are being promulgated, that are being heralded, uh, coming in on all the channels, all the usual uh, suspects, you know, media sources and so forth, and what they call sources <laughs> in the media business. And, and they're saying, well, we think this is right, we think that's right. There's, there's a lot of ways that are coming in 
through doctrines of devils and all kinds of things that seem right to men, but the end thereof, their ultimate output, their, the abs, listen, the ultimate product that they will produce is death or what leads to death. And death meaning not just the extinction of a life, the loss of a life, but the worst part is the ultimate separation of people from God. That is the worst kind of death. Because the word death literally means, if you look at the etymological definition of death and what the word really means, it means separation. Separation. When, when people physically die, what occurs there, the death is the separation of the spirit and the soul of a person from the physical body. The physical body ceases to function. That is the dust that returns to the ground. But God talks about the spirit that returns to God who gave it. So physical death is the separation of the spirit and soul of people from their physical body. Now, there's something called spiritual death which is the separation of men from God because of sin. Sin separates from us from God. That's why God sent Jesus to once again, if you would please, uh, I love 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. So therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation or a new creature. Behold, all, old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And see, it goes on to explain how God literally through that transaction was reconciling the world to himself. He was doing it through the person of Jesus Christ, reconciling us to himself. Why? Because we've been separated from God through sin, the sin of Adam, the fall in the garden, uh, the fact that all have sinned and as a result, all are in need of salvation. Well, once God in the fullness of time sent his son to die on the cross, and to pay the full price for our redemption. Now, in other words, God has pretty well put salvation in place. What is important is that people receive it. You see, God didn't make people robots. He made us free moral agents. The one true freedom all human beings have is the power of choice. They can choose between alternatives. We're not talking about multiple choice here, really. It's more like a true or a false, two possible answers. So we choose between alternatives. And the choice, the alternative choice that we choose, each has its own set of consequences. Now, consequences are not always negative. Some consequences are positive. So it, see, if you choose Jesus, <laughs> the consequences of that choice are very positive because then as a result, you receive or inherit eternal life. If you choose against Jesus, you choose Satan, you choose the way that seems right to men, but the end thereof are deaths. You choose to follow that philosophy, that, uh, uh, that train of thought and that style of living. Well, well, now you're moving into the kingdom of darkness and the consequences are very, very dark, very, very bleak. And they also carry eternal weight. That's the thing about making the choice. I, I tell you, man, the salvation, the weight of, sal uh, of eternity is in that choice. I said the weight of eternity is in that choice. Jesus said to his disciples in Mark's gospel, chapter 16, he said, uh, preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth, go, or rather, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. See, when the gospel is presented, it, it essentially brings the divide be in, between humanity. Right there, that's the most important choice. That's why I said the weight of eternity is in that choice. You're either going to choose Jesus or you're, not, or you're going to reject him. It, it's one of the two. And, and that's why it's so very, very important that we get this message out to you. So, you know, developing a biblical worldview of what's going on. I know there's a lot of tragic things going on. There's a lot of chaos, calamity, and confusion, all of which Jesus said we could expect. He said it would all be unfolding. It would all be happening. And he told you why. And he's also told you that, look, all these things must happen, but the end is not yet. And truly it's not. Uh, frankly, there's a lot more schedule activities, if I may, 
on the prophetic timeline of God. Lots of scheduled activities. And it doesn't make any difference who's running what country. It doesn't make any difference what party gets in power in any political uh, environment here, Europe, Asia, wherever they are, South America, Canada, Australia. It doesn't make any difference where uh, God's events, the events or activity of events on his prophetic timeline will happen as he has ordained for them to happen, as he has ordered for them to happen. We're not aware of the exact schedule, but Jesus left us a huge clue. He said, now, when you see these things, when you hear these things, when you uh, hear of these things, when you recognize, in other words, he said, you'll be able to recognize the season in which things are about to happen. The season, but not exactly the hour and the second and the click of, you know, we're on digital time now. Everything just flashes up. All of our clocks and things are synchronized. You know, you got the atomic clock and all that. So everybody's clock does the same thing. I, I find it fascinating to drive in my car and my little digital clock match and my phone hit the same hour, same minute, right at the same time. It is, it is really amazing. But that's, that's the uh, world we live in now. So we're living in a time ladies and gentlemen, when the battle between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of Satan is heating up uh, as never before. And uh, there's a need for us to understand the principles of spiritual protection. Because I don't know about you. I don't want to be deceived. I don't want to be deluded. I really want to know the truth. Because Jesus, among other things, said in John 8, 31, 32, he said, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. Wow, you shall know the truth. In other words, Jesus says, look, become intimate with the truth, with the knowledge of the truth of God's word. As a result, it will usher freedom into your life. You will be a free person. Now, it doesn't, it doesn't automatically remove us from the world, the world system, and the issues that are going on in. See, here's the deal. I just said to you that we're living in a time when a battle is going on. A battle between the kingdom of heaven and a battle between the kingdom of darkness, all right? God and Satan. And, and here's the deal. Because we're a part of the kingdom of God, a part of the kingdom of heaven, oh, by automatic, by default, we're part of the battle. We're, we're in the war too. We're, we're in the theater of battle. And, and you know what? Like I told you about war, there's casualties. Yeah, there's casualties. There's casualties among the citizens of the kingdom. And the citizens of darkness. Oh, yeah, there's casualties on both sides. The difference is the casualties on our side end up in heaven. The casualties on the other side end up in hell. There you go. Comes right back down to the one true freedom all humans have to choose between alternatives that have consequences associated with them. Now, I would love to get down into the subscript of dealing with all that, but time will not permit me to do that. There's some basic and more fundamental points that I want to bring to bear in this discussion about what we need to know now. Because people, some people are paying attention to what's going on in the world. They say, well, I'm aware of that conflict. And I'm going to tell you, you're going to be aware of it because there's no place on earth that the effects of what's going on in that war will not touch in some way. See, when wars like this break out, ladies and gentlemen, it has a peculiar effect on almost everything that's involved in the structure of human government. There's going to be political uh, vacillation. There's going to be economic vacillation. There's going to be social upheaval and, and, and vacillation. We're seeing that and I'm witness to it in our own nation. And these things, these demonstrations and protests and whatnot, they're happening in cities all over the world. It's not just in our New York and in our Los Angeles or in our Atlanta or wherever, wherever we are here in the United States of America. It's in other uh, nations, in Europe, France, and England. It's all over the place. Uh, and it's amazing. And it, all this seemed to spontaneously break out once this war got very much under, underway. And yes, I, I understand, I understand the, the narratives behind it and why these things are happening. But you know what? There are other forces that are involved, and we're going to see this right here. I want you to go to Luke's Gospel now, chapter 11. Luke's Gospel, chapter 11. Because this will also sort of pull the curtain back so you can see what's really going on. Now, I know at first glance, 
you say, well, the war is happening and all these conflicts of, between human governments and so forth are going on because people are selfish and people are angry and people are greedy and, and people are uh, tyrants and this and that and the other. But there's something more. There's something behind all of that. You've heard me say numerous times that everything is spirit driven. No exception. There are no exceptions. Everything is spirit driven. So let's go to Luke chapter 11 and verse 14. We'll start. It says about Jesus. Now he was casting out a devil and it was dumb. And it came to pass when the devil was gone out, the dumb spake. Now what was dumb actually was the man in whom this devil was residing. And the manifestation of this particular spirit, a dumb spirit, was to prevent the man from being able to speak. Yes, there was a physical impediment because of the entrenchment of the stronghold of a dumb spirit in this man. But it said Jesus cast the spirit out. He was casting out a devil and it was dumb and it came to pass. When the devil was gone out, the dumb spake and the people wondered. Wow. Maybe this is a guy from the community. You know, he's been dumb, hadn't been able to speak all his life. And then all of a sudden Jesus comes in and says to the dumb spirit, you dumb spirit, come out of this man. And the dumb spirit had to obey Jesus. He came out. He, he's up against this. Listen to me. No demon can resist God. No devil can resist God. Uh, when God gives an order and when he gives a command, it's got to go. Now, the good news is we as citizens of the kingdom, did you know that we have power of authority to use the name of Jesus and that we may also, uh, pardon me, dismiss demon spirits that are finding function and manifestation in people's lives? We can dispossess them. Uh, you know, I'm trying to think of that term where they, you know, they turn you out of your house. They, they give you a dispossess notice, right? And they say, you got to leave here. Well, that's exactly what you had to tell the demons and devils. You got to leave here. You're no longer welcome here. You're, you're out. And that's what Jesus did. He cast out this dumb spirit that was uh, manifesting itself by keeping this man from being able to talk or have the power of speech. And the Bible says that when it was gone out, the dumb man who was once dumb spoke. He's not dumb anymore. And the people wondered. They hadn't seen anything quite like this. Notice it goes on. But some of them said, as they probably are still doing today. Some of them said, he casts out devils through Beelzebub, the chief of the devils. That's, that's what they call Satan. He, has, he goes by a number of names, you know, uh, the, the, the accuser of the brethren, the slanderer, but they knew him as Beelzebub. That's what they, they're accusing Jesus of, ca of taking charge of demons through Beelzebub, the chief of the devils. Isn't that interesting? Even back then, they recognized that the devil had a hierarchy of operation or a kingdom of darkness. Well, that's revealed in Ephesians 6, where it says now there's principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness of this world, and spiritual wicked, wickedness in the heavenlies or in high places. And that's, that speaks of structure and order in the kingdom of darkness. And of course, Satan is on top of the whole deal. Now notice, and others tempting him, verse 16, I'm in Luke 11, and others tempting him sought of him a sign from heaven. Hey, we need some verification. <laughs> right. We need some verification. Uh, we need confirmation. If, if you're not casting these demons out by Beelzebub, who are you casting them out? Who's, whose power are you using or what authority are you doing this stuff? But he, Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said unto them, Every kingdom, here's a principle, every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation. You better listen to this. And a house divided against a house is, it falleth. Let me read that again. Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation. And a house divided against a house falleth. In other words, every house divided against itself cannot stand this is a powerful principle. It's true in your homes. It's true in business and in the marketplace. It's true in the sacred space we call the church. 
And of course, the church is literally the, the people. That's the true church is people. The, the church is not brick, mortar, steel, and all the rest of that. That's just the house or the housing provision in which the true church operates, functions, holds services, and does other things. This is a powerful statement Jesus is making here. They accused him of casting out demons by Beelzebub. These are things you need to know right now. And they accused him of that. They accused him of that. And so Jesus said, let me get you fellas straight. All right. Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation. In other words, he's trying to tell them, do you see this dumb folks all around you, blind people, this, that, they're all over the place, lunatics, murderers, thieves, all this kind of thing, adulterers and, and so forth and so on. People caught up in the occult, they're everywhere. Uh, and they're, they're functioning everywhere. I mean, listen, Satan is not going to come against himself. So what happened is Jesus has come. Now, he said, it goes on, verse 18, if Satan also be divided against himself, how shall his kingdom stand? Huh? Revelation knowledge right here. If Satan also be divided against himself, how shall his kingdom stand? The Lord acknowledges there is a structure, a kingdom, an entity on the dark side. Now get your Star Wars stuff out of the way. This is the real dark side. That thing in the movie is something else altogether. Although I have to say, and I've seen a couple of the movies, yeah, that stuff, you could relate that to the devil and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, it's dark, all right. But but what I'm saying is, it, it, and of course, the, the good side in Star Wars, they call it the force. The force be with you. Hey, the best force to have with you is the force of the Holy Ghost, the force of God, the force of the gospel, the force of Jesus, the Savior. Praise the Lord. That's our force. Amen. But you don't want to get on the dark side. So Jesus said, if Satan also be divided against himself, how, can, how shall his kingdom stand? Because you say that I cast out devils through Beelzebub. Why would I be undoing myself if that's true? And he said, now listen, if I... By Beelzebub cast out devils, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore shall they be your judges. In other words, you look, there were exorcists back then that were casting out spirits. These people had knowledge of these things. And Jesus is putting them, he's challenging them. He said, well, now listen, if you're accusing me of casting them out by the demons, don't you have exorcists practicing? They're among your family. They're among your community or they're among your uh, groups and they're casting out spirits. Well, you know, listen, they're going to be uh, testifying against you. They will be your judges because in so many words, you're accusing them. But if I, with the finger of God, cast out devils, no doubt the kingdom of God is come upon you. When a strong man armed keepeth his palace, his goods are in peace. But when a stronger than he shall come upon him and overcome him, he taketh from him all his armor, wherein he trusted and divideth his spoils. Listen, when Jesus shows up with this man possessed of, with a dumb spirit, a greater. Now, the, the, in other words, I was telling you earlier, the devil had a stronghold on this guy to, and manifested or presented him, him as, as a dumb person. Not dumb in intelligence, but the fact that he couldn't speak. And what happened? Well, that's a stronghold. You, you could call that a strong man, a, a, a stubborn demon. But a greater than that demon came. A greater than that power came. A greater than that principality, that ruler of the darkness of this world. A greater than that principality and the spiritual wickedness came in the person of Jesus Christ. And what happened? He overcame him. He said, you've got to come out of it. The Bible says Jesus cast the dumb spirit out. And what happened? The man talked. What happened then? People wondered. They were excited. They were oohing and on. They said, oh my goodness, we've never seen this before. But when a stronger than he shall come upon him and overcome him, he taketh away him all his ar from him all his armor, wherein he trusted, and divideth his spoils. There was no armament that any demon could defend itself from God or from God's power. He, Jesus goes on to say, that is not with me is against me. And he that gathereth not with me scattereth. Now, here's another powerful principle. And these are things we need to know now. 
Because when you see, listen, you better get a biblical worldview and forget about everything the pundits are telling you, opinions of that are being written and this and that. I'm not saying there isn't any substance. It's nothing worth paying attention to a little bit, but, but you can't consume all, you can't believe all that own press out there, all right? You better stick with the word, stick with Jesus. If you don't want a man to deceive you, if you don't want to be troubled or anxious or afraid because of the things that are coming on the earth, then stick with the word because it can build hope in you. It's a source of inspiration and blessing and encouragement, and it absolutely can bring you practical instruction for everyday living. Let's get to this 24th verse. I'm in Luke chapter 11. Jesus said this, when the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, now you can just suffice that to say, that's a summary. Uh, unclean spirit, any spirit on the dark side, any demonic spirit, unclean, any spirit like that, anything that's working countermeasure toward God, anything that is counterintuitive to God, that's of the devil. Listen, when the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, so what Jesus is saying is, yes, the first choice of demon spirits to manifest themselves and gain expression in this world is through people. Now, they will also invade animals, but they will, people are their first choice. But notice, he said, when the unclean spirit has gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places. In other words, places where he can't express, places where he can't gain the animation that he wants to present his evil and wickedness into the world. He doesn't have a stronghold established, all right? What is he doing? He's walking, seeking rest. This is consistent. Remember when God asked Satan where he'd been in the book of Job, and Satan said, I've been walking up and down in the earth. And that's when God has said, well, have you considered my servant Job, how there's none like him in all the earth? Notice that the devil said he had been walking up and down. But the Bible says that the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth. So God's way ahead of the devil. De if the devil's just walking, man, it, it, you know, he's got a slow pace to do it, but it doesn't mean he's not getting any place or doing anything. So notice, so Jesus said he's walking through dry places, seeking rest and finding none. He saith, I will return unto my house whence I came out. And when he comes, he finds it swept and garnished. Then goeth he, and taketh to him seven other spirits, more wicked than himself, and they enter in and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. This is powerful. We look in our culture, we look in our society, we look at the nations of the world. We are witness to horrific acts and events altercations, criminal activity, unrest, chaos, calamity, and confusion, and wonder what's going on. How is it that people that seemed and appeared to be normal everyday people with families, with business, with uh, participation in their communities, upstanding pillars in the community among other uh, accolades, all of a sudden, become raving mad men and mad women out there and commit horrific crimes and acts and so forth and so on. Pull the curtain back. There's a lot behind the scenes. And I'm telling you, everything is spirit driven. And here Jesus is just literally illustrating to you how this all works. In other words, he, he didn't get it. It didn't take a long discourse. I mean, I'm looking at about three or four verses that I just shared with you. And Jesus unfolded, inc I mean, incredible revelation now. He said, first of all, yes, demons will attack people. They will set up a stronghold in people and gain expression in one way or another. But he said, when they get cast out, so Jesus dismissed that demon out of that man. Now, it's, it sort of reminds me a little bit of the story of the woman that was caught in adultery. Remember, you know, they drove her to the uh, wall there and they were just about to stone her to death. And, you know, but they didn't, they didn't bring the guy with her. You know, it seemed to me that'd be ironclad proof that, you know, she was caught in adultery. So they let the guy go. <laughs> he got a pass, but she didn't. And they brought her there and they were about to stone her to death. And then Jesus said, uh, they said, what I asked you, he said, well, we caught this woman in the act of adultery, the very act. What do you say, preacher? What do you say, uh, rabbi? And Jesus said, here's what I say. 
He among you that is without sin, let him cast the first stone. Well, that was the end of that deal. Uh, what would you say? I'd say that the case was thrown out. <laughs> the case was overruled. Now, you know, here you had all these fellows witnesses. You have to wonder what kind of perversion are they into that they're sitting there looking in the window, waiting for these people to go through all the motions and then find they grab her, let that dude slip out of the back door and then bring her ready to stone her to death and bring capital punishment on her. And then they're going to justify it and say, well, we got the law of Moses back and stuff. He says she should be stoned. What do you have to say about it? Well, you see what they didn't realize, there was a greater than Moses there. <laughs> Absolutely. And he said, well, I say that he among you that is without sin, let him cast the first stone. Well, you know, the Bible says that one by one, all those fellows left and they dropped their rocks. The only person that was left was the woman and Jesus was there. And uh, he said, woman, where are your accusers? She said, I have none. <laughs> Case is dismissed. Court is adjourned. Neither do I condemn you. And he said, go and sin no more. Now, the age question, the age old question is this. One has to wonder, thank God that Jesus showed mercy and compassion. He forgave the woman. He, he literally freed her from a fate of death and destruction. The question begs in our minds, did the woman never ever commit sin again? Now, maybe she didn't go into adultery again. Maybe she didn't do that kind of thing. But did the woman in fact go, do you think she may have made mistakes in the rest of her life? Uh, probably so, probably so. And of course, Jesus said, go and sin no more. But see, without the power of the Holy Spirit, without the power of the word, and understand Jesus was on the earth at that time. He had not yet died and redeemed all of humankind and to redeem us all from sin. So that woman was absolutely subject to do it again. And this is the problem here with demons in and out of people. The guy was freed of this demon spirit, but is it possible that another could come in? Well, that's exactly what Jesus said. He said, listen, the spirit has gone out, but he's walking around trying to find another place where he can establish a stronghold but he looks back and he says, man, that place that I was thrown out of or dispossessed, nobody else moved in. Guess I can go in there. In other words, maybe that person didn't choose to accept Christ, didn't choose to get God in their life. And so it's left a void. Well, this spirit comes back and Jesus said he brings seven other spirits more wicked than himself. There is no reference to feminine gender, by the way, describing unclean spirits and demons and devils. Nope. They're all in the masculine gender description. He, himself. Yeah, people are arguing about pronouns. Well, I, let me give you some pronouns. Jesus said about demons as he, himself, they, meaning a collection of them. I remember another case with the Gadarenean demoniac, they call it, the, the madman of Gadara, where he it was said to have had a legion of demons uh, occupying, a legion of demons. Now, a Roman legion is somewhere between two and 4,000 individuals. Oh, my goodness. No wonder this fellow was running through graveyards, cutting himself with stones, breaking chains, and all other kinds of crazy, inhuman, and, and lunatic things. And that's what happens when demons find a stronghold and establish themselves in people's lives to this day. Let me leave you with a couple of things, and we'll come back and develop on these at another time. But there are three keys to help ensure spiritual protection, prote protection, beg your pardon. Number one, being under authority. Being under authority. You need to be under the authority of God. And then two, you need to be under delegated authority of God. We under shepherds, we pastors, ministers that are given the task by God to minister to people, to do what? Perfect the saints, to do the work of the ministry for the edifying of the body of Christ. So being under spiritual authority. Uh, another thing, number two, you gotta learn how to uh, forgive. Yeah, I know I'm talking about different things I had to lead into this. These are things, keys to ensure your own spiritual protection. Be under true authority, certainly the authority of God's word. You need to be operating in forgiveness. You have to understand forgiving another person is not an expression of emotion. It is an act of self-discipline. Forgiving others is not, listen, an act, an act of emotion or a, an expression of emotion but rather an act of self-discipline. And then thirdly, submission. This is not a license for disorder or confusion, none of which are of the Lord. 
Uh, submission is the umpire for governing ourselves accordingly in the Holy Spirit or the fear of the Lord. Letting the peace of God serve as the umpire for us doing the will of God in our lives. Well, that's all we have time for in this segment. And look forward to getting with you in the next exciting episode here. Praise God. But I trust that this uh, message has been a source of inspiration, encouragement, blessing, and practical instruction for everyday living. That said, glory to God. Whoever you are, wherever you are, if you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, please come with us now as we go boldly to the throne of grace to obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Pray this prayer right now and say, Dear God in heaven, I come to you realizing that in my life I have sinned and come short of your glory. I repent of all of my sin and I confess with my mouth that Jesus Christ the son of the living God who died on the cross and shed his blood to save me from all of my sin is the Lord of my life. And I believe in my heart that you raised Jesus from the dead, that I might be justified just as if I had never sinned. Lord Jesus, come into my heart and live in me now. I believe that I receive eternal life through Jesus Christ, my Lord and my Savior that I am now made a new creation in Christ Jesus, born again of the Spirit of God, in Jesus' name, amen. Well, praise the Lord. If you've prayed that prayer with us today, congratulations. Welcome into the family of God. You have passed from death unto life. You've passed from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of God's dear Son. And we want to help you in your new life in Christ Jesus. Not only... Are you now a part of the family of God? But you're now officially a citizen of the kingdom of heaven with all the rights, privileges, practices, and principles thereunto.